All right, y'all, we should be recording and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. This is the IPFS content routing work group number six. Steve, it's great to see you. Um, we are uh, working through a number of issues just for anybody logging into this call. The purpose of this content routing work group is of course, to address the content routing design decisions and support the efforts that are ongoing in content routing across IPFS and uh, the Filecoin networks as we bridge those gaps. Um, and um, the group of people here is contributing to those uh, designs and implementations of um, content routing across both of these networks. So to get started, uh, for reference, there's a handful of important docs. I've tried to grab the most timely ones um, and place them up here relative to the things that we're currently working on for anybody that's attempting to catch up or potentially get context about the discussions that are happening uh, within this group. And then um, as we uh, dive in, we'll go ahead and grab updates from the contributing teams um, to uh, kind of get a picture of where everyone's at uh, with the last two weeks of progress. Uh, so uh, generally, uh, I kind of open it up. If anybody wants to start off, they've got something they're really excited on that they've kind of wrapped up in the last two weeks, open forum. Uh, if not, I can jump in. All right. I'll, uh, uh, 337 was finally merged. Woo! <laughs> That's exciting. That's big stuff, Gus. Thanks for, uh, thanks for that update. I think, uh, we've all been looking forward to that for sure. Dorfin, do you want to kick us off with the updates? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, go ahead and I'll, uh, I'll take notes. Sure. So on the IPNI side, over the last two weeks, uh, we've been uh, improving monitoring of the double hashing uh, query pipeline. Uh, so we are we are continuing to monitor the population of data on the double hash side, so that we can eventually switch all the queries to be on double hashed. We worked on export of advertisements in bulk uh, in car files. And then making those available elsewhere. Uh, initially, we're targeting S3 as a storage mechanism, but the general idea is that we want to enable other indexers to import uh, advertisements in bulk, um, become up to date very fast, as well as uh, providing mirroring for multiple places to get the advertisement chain. Uh, this would then reduce um, the chances of overwhelming an index provider uh, when multiple in indexer endpoints go to fetch advertisements from it. Uh, we have Cascade DHT deployed on uh, production uh, with some hiccups, which I think there's an item in the walkthrough to talk about. Uh, I'll get to that, I'll get back to that one. Uh, we have two new specifications on uh, IPFS to extend the nice work that the IPFS Stewart team did, especially us on uh, introducing the delegated routing. The two specifications introduce uh, extensions to put provider records. This was the th thing that was excluded from uh, 337 to reduce the scope. It's put back up. And there is a new spec for uh, delegating IPNS, um, which I'll also like to discuss later on. Aside from that, uh, we have streaming uh, rolled out across all our backends that includes the double hashing as well. Uh, so as far as the IPNI uh, lookup endpoints are concerned, uh, we support a new NDJSON format. Uh, I know that us has been working on the streaming stuff. So um, the next step there is to move out, move uh, NDJSON support for the delegated routing endpoints. Uh, which I think we have already rolled out in one endpoint, but not, not at sit.contact. And I think that's about it. Is there anything else I've missed, Ivan, Will? 
No, I think you got it all right. Thanks, Massey. Awesome. I'll hand it over I to did not... pick the next person. Oh, I, I was going to, I, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't talk about streaming, which I forgot about. Um, so I, I, I'll just mention it since you just mentioned it. We're already talking about it. Yeah. So I, I, there's a PR open now finally for Libby PFS to add streaming support to the client and the server implementations in there. Uh, and I've, I've integrated that with Kubo and tested it against Casca DHD, but not Sid.contact because this is not rolled out yet in Sid.contact, but it works with Casca DHD. Um, it gets the like incremental provider records from the stream and feeds them into Kubo fine. So I don't, the PR is pretty small, so it shouldn't be a big deal. And then we'll be able to upgrade Kubo with that. And then we'll get uh, streaming provider records in Kubo. That's great, Gus. Uh, everybody keeps asking me how to pronounce that name, and I feel like you just nailed the winner, buddy. Casca DHT is it? <laughs> it's in the read me, Torfin. Casca <laughs> DHT. That's a nice trick to figure out who actually reads those things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely it's read a, it, but I think I missed that part. <laughs> It's an evil way of making it memorable, such that nobody could pronounce it and keep thinking about it. <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, Guy, did you want to jump in with uh, updates for Probe Lab? Yeah, sure. Um, so on our side, so it's been mostly working on the spec. So thank you, everyone that gave a review. Um, it helped uh, improve the, the spec. We added some mermaid diagrams and but the spec still needs some attention. So if you haven't given a review yet, um, please um, uh, yeah, write a review there and we'll make sure to address it so that we can move forward with it. And yeah, that's mostly it. Cool. And then it looks like uh, we don't have any folks from the Bifrost team here right now. They're probably all busy with Saturn rollout support, I'm guessing. Uh, to be fair, they've got a lot going on over there. So we'll uh, we'll check back in with them. I'll try to get some updates from them, actually, just for the scope of this work group and get them in the notes uh, asynchronously so that we kind of have them all in one place. Uh, and we'll skip topics uh, relating to them. I was kind of going through some of their executional topics from the last content routing work group that we had. And they've done a lot of updates in their GitHub that merit attention. Uh, I'll mention them, but we'll obviously try to catch up with them to see where they're at. Um, and I'll throw the links in here relative to these, but um, timing for the rollout of delegated routing in V0.18.1, uh, um, they have a GitHub issue open right now to uh, deploy that to all of their cluster. And um, I, it looked like they were probably going to complete it pretty soon. So uh, I wanted to kind of find out from them what, um, what the timeline really was, whether or not it was actually within the week, which is what they'd been proposing, or uh, potentially uh, there's, there's uh, more there to that. We'll skip over that, and potentially we can come back to it later, especially since uh, those folks aren't here right now. I put uh, at the top of the list, um, the Casca DHT, uh, NDJSON, uh, Liddell, um, Lytle's been noticing some uh, 404s, I think, of specifically DHT lookups from Saturn that are hitting the uh, indexer via Lassie. And um, I, I wanted to just make sure, do we have like a clear picture or like logs of like which queries are falling victim to this uh, failure and whether or not uh, the indexer team, you know, we removed resource manager from the scope of our lookup requests that are going to DHT after discussing with Dennis a little bit about uh, kind of the limitations of that service. Uh, but the question is, is uh, whether or not we can rally up more support and I'm sure Masi, please. So I can, uh, yep. So I, I have a bunch of updates on this one. Uh, so 
over the last week, uh, I've, I've been observing Cascade DHD. Uh, there was an issue with uh, resource manager where uh, increased resources were still causing the uh, accelerated delegated routing and refresh mechanism to fail. Uh, I've just went ahead and disabled a resource manager completely. That rectified that problem. Uh, of course, it comes with disadvantages, but you know, in terms of service restarts, uh, we are okay because it's running on a Kubernetes environment. It gets uh, restarted, no problem. Uh, I've bumped the resources on it. Uh, the whole process seems to be very CPU intensive. That's something that I would love help from maybe Adin or Lidl on just getting a general idea of whether this is expected uh, for lookup to be such CPU, CPU intensive thing. Um, aside from that on the 404s specifically, so before we jump to 404s, can I ask you to change that title please? Because there are two two things that are mixed up in that title. Andy Jason has nothing to do with 404s. It's just mechanics of exchanging just results. Right? Yeah. Yep. So, uh, I figured out why the 404s are happening. Uh, there are two places that things go wrong. First, first one is the circuit breaker mechanism in index uh, star, which is the load balancer in front of signal contact. Uh, whenever failures happen too often, the circuit breaker op opens and excludes backends from the endpoint, and then it heals itself after you know periodically uh, half open and retry and whatever. Uh, what happens is that when the queries hit sit.contact for um, DHT cascade uh, with non-streaming content type, um, obviously non-streaming content types take longer. So what happens is that when the uh, queries get cascaded over DHT, it takes longer than the timeout. The timeout gets fed back into circuit breaker. Circuit breaker thinks that endpoint is no good, excludes it from the backend and from then on, we get a lot of 404s because no request gets routed to it. Then it opens and the same thing happens again. Uh, so uh, what I've done to fix that is to migrate all the propagation of lookups on c.contact onto streaming, regardless of what the accept header is on the request side. So what happens is that if a request site comes in with, H with JSON, I translate it to ndjson, send it to all the backends, now that all the backends support ndjson, then collect the results within timeout of 30 seconds and respond. And then the idea is that uh, that should also populate the cache on CloudFront side, which then means the next uh, consecutive lookup for the same key would be uh, served from the cache quickly. The other issue that I've noticed is that uh, peer routing takes much longer than uh, content routing um, in Cascade DHD uh, or you know like DHD client. Um, the way that the res results are returned is SID, SID is looked up, a list of providers are found, and for each of those providers that don't have an address, then a second lookup is done to find the address. And the second lookup uh, and until the second, and uh, this whole process is done sequentially. So once once we reach a result that doesn't have an address, we go and find the address. It takes much, much longer. And by the time we come back to return results, timeout has already happened. So I've just finished putting up a PR, which does this asynchronously. That means if we come across a provider record that does have address, we immediately return it. If it doesn't have an address, there's a second go routine that goes and looks up the address and then feeds the results back. I've added extra optimizations there, like search for local peer store before looking for addresses. If it exists, just look it up from there. I've also added limiting for peers without addresses because there's a lot of lookups that fail because of no addresses found and those are fairly expensive. So I've added a TTL caching mechanism to only retry within, I don't know, 20 minutes. Um, not every time we found that peer ID. And the, th the last thing that I've done is, and I love Adin's comment on this, I update the lib P2P peer store with the addresses that I find during lookup. 
And I think that should improve lookup uh, hop count as well as just the general returning of um, results. I've been testing it sustainably. Um, I'm hoping to roll that out today and I'll post updates. And that's me, Adin, please go ahead. Yeah, this, this looks good. Um, so the, the reason why the you're you're getting why things are taking a long time, uh, my suspicion for why things are taking a long time for some of the peer records is that the way in which like if you do a fine peer, the way in which you determine you determine which is the best like record for them is basically you just connect to them. Uh, because uh, due, due to legacy insane reasons that maybe uh, maybe we'll get fixed when uh, uh, Guy goes and rewrites the RPC code is that find node and find peer are the same RPC call instead of different ones. Um, so we can have like slightly different logic that that returns there a little earlier. But what's happening is like you're trying to connect to a peer that may or may not even be around or, you know, something like that. Um, so that's that's it's, I think what's happening what's happening there. So doing the asynchronous streaming the thing with the timeout is like that's that's the way to go. Um, in theory, you could end up in a situation where like you discover more addresses later, but it I think it's probably fine as as it is. So so when the addresses are discovered later, if the context is not so this is goes in a bit of implementation detail. If the context is not cancelled, I add it to the outgoing extreme of results. But if it is canceled, I've updated the peer store. So next time next, yeah. that peer ID is found, then you know, just yeah. best we can do really. Yeah, I think that's that's reasonable. I um oh, you asked about the CPU usage. Yeah. So basically um short version is yeah, it sucks. Uh the it, it's not it's not that it uses a lot of CPU is the issue. The issue is more that it does it periodically. Like it does it, it does it in like a spiky way. And that's the thing that makes you miserable is that during that spike, you're very sad during the refresh. Um, we, that, that can be smoothed out. That's like one of the, that's like one of the known issues with, with how that thing is currently set up. It's just kind of, yeah, that's sort of unfortunately how it's currently um, set up. I do wonder though, um, how spiky this should be. Cause I feel like CPU is mostly connection stuff and you should probably have high limits because there's like, say there's like 20,000 nodes in the network. If you get, you know, if you get like a you know 500 requests or something or you get a thousand requests if you get a thousand requests a minute that means that over the course of a minute you probably have to talk to all 20,000 peers anyway and so i would hope that most of those connections are staying alive otherwise you're just going to keep closing and reopening them um so, so this brings up a question for me i didn't did, we are using the default uh, connection manager, which I think would be the limit of, is it 192 high water limit? Should we, do you think we should bump that up too? Yeah, agreed, Gus. But uh, yeah, you should, we should have higher, you should bump the high, the high waters and yeah, and low waters because they, uh, you need to make those connections anyway, right? Over the course of, again, if you get a, if you get a thousand, queries over the course of you know x minutes then over those x minutes you will have to hit everybody yep and on the cpu side the the main uh, thing i love to get my head around is from optional operational perspective how much cpu to give it because i, I give it two cores I, I bumped it to three cores now it it doesn't matter if it's hungry it's just like giving it enough resources so uh, i guess i'll i'll monitor with the extra resources and keep bumping until it's 80 ish Utilized. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah. I know. Uh, you know, Gusky, I don't know if you have any thoughts on like. Yeah, I, I mean, aside from where where it seems 
like priority wise in terms of trying to make this less resource intensive by basically spreading the load out. Um, the way to do I, this is basically. I love this. I love this thread because it's it solves a lot of other issues too. Like this is the reason that we can't turn this on by default for everybody, right? Um, and if we could turn it on by default for everybody, the DHT performance would improve dramatically. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, which is a huge win in lots of other areas too, like this whole bit swap nonsense. Um, so for, for me, I think I think it's like, it should be really high priority, um, but I don't know how it stacks up against everything else. So, so the other I'm sorry, considering I'm knee deep into this, I can take the first pass of it. Just see for if there are any low hanging fruits. Yeah, I mean the, the I main the main it. thing, and uh, I think I have some notes I've shared with the pro lab folks and, and others around this is basically um, right now we have two dumb options for the routing tables. So there's the standard client who's which says I have a fixed routing table size. And that is like, you know, 20 peers per bucket, and that's it. And then I have the accelerated client, which says I am putting everyone in my bucket. And what we want is something that like is just a cache, like it, it builds its size over time. Um, and that way it sort of scales based on how much you use it. And so you don't even have to think it just, are you doing a thousand queries every 10 minutes? If so, your routing table is going to be full all the time. Are you doing one query every X minutes? If so, you're going to have the small routing table. Um, I think that's like kind of how we save time there. But it's it's a bit of, it's a bit of a pain. The reason I didn't do it initially was I, I had no time, and it was uh, it's easier to reason about. I guess it's easier to reason about when the query should terminate, when you have everybody in your routing table. So you have to like do a little more effort, but um i think it's 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 good effort yeah agreed the i saw bit swap is written i have a question about bit swap too uh, i'm not sure if you're finished on this subject but i'd love to i want to i want to we can get to it i wanted to mention too real quick i don't know if you're aware there there are other dragons in the accelerated dht client uh like like if if the refresh fails for example you'll have a staled routing table and you won't know it uh i don't i there was some talk about resource manager earlier i'm not sure if that was this specific system or not but like just be aware that like if you get throttled or something doesn't work when it's refreshing the routing table you could have stale entries mm -hmm. and or an incomplete routing table if it's like the bootstrapping like that's another thing too is that like when it bootstraps you don't know when it's done you just kind of have to guess um well, there's a there's a are you done thing you can pull, but yeah, I mean, could be better. Is that part? Of, is it is that plumbed through Kubo? Yeah. Okay. Oh, but you're not hey, using the, Kubo. Okay. Would that that's ready? True. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. I think I got disconnected. Uh, Accelerated DHT client has a ready function. Yeah. Would it return false if the freshness of routing state is failed? I, th I think it does. It should, yeah. Great. Yeah. Because just make sure you check that. I'm <laughs> using. Okay. So the logic I'm using is the same as some guy, which I didn't wrote. So I think it reverts back to the regular client. Fair. If it's not ready, which is good. Yeah, I, I mean, we didn't production like that code hasn't been run in production and hammered at. So uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust the uh, Dean wrote it, but it's a, it's a good start, I guess. Credit is already given at you. It's just far too late. It's already calling in production. Uh, yeah, it's uh, everything's production around here, buddy. We're hey, Kubo, Kubo is still hungry. alpha quality software. So. <laughs> <laughs> and by alpha, we mean top. <laughs> exactly. Alpha Gmail Bravo. wasn't beta for like 10 years, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's fair. We all use it. Um, Qu okay, sorry, so a bit question swap, on. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. Bit swap. Um, um, 
uh, does uh, Kubo peer state get updated as part of BitSwap gossip, which then becomes useful on DHD only lookup? Or is it completely a separate beast? I think there's the, the, the libp2p host is shared. So if like addresses show up in your peer store, then you can use them later when making connections. Um, yeah, but I think that's- I guess the, the, reason, the reason I'm pulling on this is, uh, is because I wonder if it would make sense for the Cascade DHT to also be a bit swap here. You don't want that. You're going to get no? spammed okay. with all these messages you don't want anything to do with. No. Gotcha. Because no, I was thinking I could get the peer store up to date and larger by just listening to gossip. And then it also covers, increases the chances of finding things by 30% because I think one third of requests are being satisfied by BitSwap in, in IPFS world. Yeah, but what you don't, what you would, Things that will make you and everybody else sad are if you if you did it like this, right? So you would get, you would be listening to everybody's requests and basically responding no to all of them, right? I don't have anything. And if you started asking over the network, you would basically spam everyone you're connected to, which will probably be everyone who's a DHT server for every single request, which sort of like defeats the structural purpose of the of the network where you only ask gotcha. like, the people you need also the the perp the the goal of that for you mossy is is to get more peer records is that or to, right yeah like i don't think that helps any because they don't they don't gossip about other peers i i don't think no they don't mm. it's just if you just they ask a peer ask if they have you know, data so you already have to know the peer to begin with so it's not going to help you discover more peers uh Gotcha. That makes sense. That's that's the DHT. If you if you boost your if you boost your high water low water to be like a big node, then you should be fine. And again, you might even you will probably even save CPU by increasing the high water and low water because you won't be thrashing your connections with the connection manager. You're just going to be like, I, I keep using you. You can close yours to me if you don't want to deal with me anymore. But like. I'm happy to keep talking to you because I'm going to ask you for a record again in like 10 minutes, if not already. Yep, that sounds great. Thank you so much. Thanks, y'all. That's a super illuminating discussion. This is a really valuable topic and feedback. Um, I think, Masi, did you get everything you needed out of that? I feel like we covered a I, lot of it. I did and more. Thank you. <laughs> great. Um, and uh, another thing that came up is we met with Dennis late last week, um, topically to kind of discuss about the structure of the indexer and kind of its architecture and likewise to get benefits from him of kind of discussing the um, scope of how much content um, GI that we kind of mentioned is not currently in the DHT or indexers. I think we we got a pretty good uh, feedback from that. I can kind of drop some of the data. He referenced a talk that he'd done where he had kind of analyzed a lot of this and shared some graphs. Um, I have those links and I'll, I'll drop them in the notes here for anyone that's interested. Um, but I wanted to check, Masi, did we, did we need any more data or details to support um, allowing indexing for retrievals on the basis of like understanding that kind of ghosty type of data in the network. Um, do we need deeper analysis? Should we take that uh, further? Or did we get enough feedback from that discussion to kind of feel confident about our design approach? So I think this was related to one of the action items in the previous uh, working group. Yeah. Uh, the the main thing is one third of the SIDs won't be discoverable uh, with, um, you know, with, if, if you have IPNI and DHT cascading enabled, still the chances is 60% success because based on the data, it looks like one third of the SIDs are getting discovered from uh, BitSwap gossip and don't end up on the DHT. Uh, so then the question is, if if that 60% success rate is 
not acceptable, then we need to compensate for it by doing some bits of uh, leaching mechanism. Uh, or if it is sufficient, then you know. I don't know. I, I think I think fighting we can we can uh, we can fight this with the product folks as we like push further up. But like, I think it's time to start making people responsible for their data. Um, like one of the IPFS like classic problems is that um, everything looks like a get problem instead of a put problem. So you said like, I tried, because content addressing the data can come from anywhere, you say, I tried to fetch Baffy Fubar and it didn't happen. IPFS must be broken. When instead the result is like, the guy hosting it turned off his laptop or is like going through a tunnel or didn't advertise his records anywhere. Um, and like, now we get a new gateway binary with new error messages and stuff. And we can we can start to surface some of these issues a little further upstream um because otherwise we end up routing stuff it's like people come to us they say the gateway is broken and then we ask where's the data that's coming from pinata pinata has a problem send them to pinata like the more we can remove ourselves from being in the loop by helping users figure out what's happening the better ideally there are just no problems at all and we want that to happen but as long as problems can exist it would be good if users could like self-service a little bit. Yeah, I mean, increasing the success rate by 30% sounds, you know, interesting and sexy, right? But uh, it goes back to uh, BitTorrent where everybody being a leecher doesn't really help. Because that's <laughs> yeah, nobody, that would... nobody's stealing. Uh... Yeah, so, I mean, we could fix it, but it, it will certainly harm the network. We also think have to want good. to cut down the amount of spam. Like yeah. we we run into people like in Fiora and whatever who are like, I don't like please if you guys could stop go bit swap from spamming me with nonsense, like that would be great. Cause like my data is hosted somewhere where the IOPs are expensive or annoying and like please don't make me do this. Right. Uh, and setting up distributed bloom filters is like a pain. So like they have to deal with all of this. Um, yeah, it would be nice. I don't know, like it would take some scoping or something to figure out if it's feasible or not. But like if we didn't double down on bit swap for content routing here, like if we could use this as an opportunity to improve the network and not continue to propagate the use of BitSwap as a content router, that would be awesome. It may not be that much work. It may just be some tweaks to the DHT to improve performance and then rolling out some protocol changes or something. And, but... and I think that the reduction of spam also relates to what we talked about last time with like dropping the time to wait before you do before you do DHT queries, right? That, that happens when, uh, you you fix sessions and you like you fix the usage of sessions so that they're 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 plumbed through properly and then your CPU usage goes down you don't have to worry about this stuff so much if the bit swap stuff is like is correctly optimistic instead of just spamming everyone like maybe it spams everyone on your local network because you want the system to work even when you're on an isolated LAN. Like maybe that's fine, but like spamming all 1,000 internet connected peers that you have seems bad. I think this, um, there's a lot of value for, for people who haven't caught like the last discussion we had in content routing work group number five, there was a deep discussion about this topic that I, I think is definitely worth catching. It's kind of towards the later end of the video, uh, if you want to give it a go. One thing that I took away from that is I'm putting together kind of a, like a task and roadmap -y table for content routing as a whole. I think that would kind of serve the whole group as like a valuable visualization of like our focus of efforts. And uh, Gus, I really heard you kind of mentioning like, prioritization in the backlog. You have a massive backlog and like, where do we insert some of these things in it? Um, I wanna, you know, do the best support that we can from this work group to kind of ease that 
burden in any way that we can by like showing some goals that kind of weave together all of the interested parties and contributors in this group. So I'm working on that. It's partially put together, but it's not quite finished enough that I'd throw it in front of everyone just yet. Um, and I'll love to get all y'all's feedback on it and let me know if that's an easier way to kind of work through these problems. Um, I'm hoping to kind of add that um, that glue if that seems like a good idea to everyone. And then, so. cool. Um, I put up uh, the final call for comments on uh, 373. I, I did kind of want to ask, um, is, is there like a line in the sand date that we should be uh, looking for with that? Or is it like a line in the sand type of action relative to closing that out for comment? Um, how do we know when it's when it's like really ready? Do you have like a working code? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think to some extent, I mean, Lytle's like he's joking a little, but he's also right, which is that you yeah. learn about the thing, like you write this, you write the proposal for like what the spec's probably going to look like, and then you realize halfway through coding it that like you missed the spot. Um, yeah. uh, kind of like to give it a maybe like more. <laughs> Less jokingly, uh, joking feedback is that uh, for the previous IPIPs, we sometimes started with just uh, spec and then added uh, uh, working code. Usually, it's like against like refer reference implementation in Kubo because it's uh, what was the easiest. And then if you ship with Kubo, you more or less deployed it to the majority of the network. Uh, so I'd say it's perfectly fine for that IPIP uh, pull request to be open until let, it's fine to say like, okay, that's a, in the comment, we agree the spec is good enough to try to implement it. Then we have reference implementation. And then we bring that up to IPFS implementers sync uh, call uh, as an, as to inform like wider community that, hey, this is thing, it has a working implementation here. Uh, we are waiting for, uh, we are planning to ship that with uh, let's say next version of Kubo, uh, and that that gives people uh, applies pressure for people to uh, who are interested in this uh, to to do the first or maybe final look at it. Uh, so historically, it's it worked pretty fine. Uh, I feel this is a pretty big change for entire like IPFS ecosystem because we start talking about privacy in, in some aspects. So it's perfectly fine to keep it open until we are really, really happy with both spec and implementation. Uh, and it's been uh, often that we've shipped something uh, with Kubo. Uh, we agreed on the IPFS implementers and implementers saying that, yeah, this IPP is ratified. We just wrote comment, it's ratified, but we still kept it open for uh, like a few weeks of feedback after we shipped it in case there are some edge cases that require fixing and then uh, adding more uh, resolution to the spec. Uh, so I feel that's more or less uh, how we would do it. No, that's great perspective. Uh, and I didn't mean to imply with my question that uh, perhaps this wasn't <laughs> a good way to go about it. I just uh, wanted to make sure that uh, we were looking at it uh, appropriately from the perspective of everyone in the group. And that is the perspective we'll look at it from. That works. Um, that's good to know. On the IPNI side, uh, we have a implementation of this, which I think is 90% compatible with the spec. Uh, I've left some comments on the spec and Guy has kindly already replied. I haven't got to it yet. Guy, I promise I'll, I'll get back to you. Uh, but that's the only implementation that I know of that exists. But also adding to what Gus wrote in the chat, this whole uh, double hashing uh, working version of it should also include IPFS, DHD. So it's it's a much, much bigger chunk of work. And I think, uh, I, I don't know where we are on the DHD side of implementing the spec. So yeah, just a word on the implementation. So I totally agree that the spec can remain open for a while until we're ready to uh, 
make the migration to this new DHT because it will be a protocol breaking change. And so there is already an implementation that doesn't exactly fit the spec, but um, is uh, kind of close to uh, fitting the specs that has been implemented by ChainSafe. And the collaboration has been a little bit difficult lately. So we need to figure out if we decide to finish, uh, finish it ourselves or if we ask them to finish the implementation. And I just wanted to make sure that um, everyone agrees, at least on the ideas, on the concepts, be before we go ahead and we um, make them implement uh, what we decided. But we can give it one more week if that sounds reasonable to, to folks uh, to continue the discussion on the spec. And uh, after like a week or two, we can commit to it, not, not too strongly. So things can still be updated, but we'll go ahead with the, the implementation. I think some cool. of this Any is like figuring out what the what the ramifications are, which are going to be hard to like know exactly now, right? So, what is the how how does the how does the performance change as a function of of doing the double hashing things? Like I know for like the IPNI spec, it increases the number of round trips, and the last I checked was to like three. Maybe we can we can cut that one. Maybe we can cut it down. Uh, increases things like bandwidth with the L, uh, with whatever the 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 K lookup thing that tries to um, protect you from from you know being being spied on that way. How much is that going to hurt people when we start scale? You know, we start scaling this. So we can we can sort of estimate, to... but it's hard, right? Yeah. So we had the report. So we hired ChainSafe to do a performance report of exactly that, but it wasn't satisfying. We couldn't get information out of it. So they're working on it again and we're waiting for the results. But concerning, so the number of hops, it's expected to be the same. I'm fairly confident it's not gonna change. For the network load, it's expected to increase uh, by just the K factor. So it's possible to compute it on average. This, and for CPU, it will be great to have real number because it's a bit hard to anticipate at the effect of the encryption. Uh, Steve, I see you over there. Jump in. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'll just jump in for a couple of things on this. Um, yeah, obviously, want to get this over the line. There's been a lot of great work and discussion to get it this far. I mean, a couple of things. Realistically, um, you know, I, I don't foresee us having chain safe do the rest of the work. Um, just given where we are at with you know budgets, we're having we're winding down contracts and um, we're not extending things. So like this is going to fall likely to someone in this group to do the additional implementation work. So that, that's one thing. The other is um, like, it's but likely early next week, the Kubo maintainers need to rehuddle because you know our last our last release got sort of you know, fa fairly disrupted. You know, pouring into Ria, and then there have been some operational events that have come up, and then there's some follow out follow ups from that. Um, so there's so many good things here. I we just have to be honest with ourselves about what we can do when. Obviously, Guy is very much owning and driving double hashing, but we need to get him paired up with someone on the implementation side to work on landing this. I'd like to do it soon. I just I don't have line of sight today as to who that is and when that's going to happen. Um, so this one for me is a little bit up in the air. Um, and obviously, yes, we need to get a decent report uh, on the, the resource utilization. I know we weren't quite satisfied with what uh, ChainSafe had produced so far. Um, so like, anyway, like, I imagine this spec will be open for a bit. There are still a little ways off before rolling it out, but I certainly don't want to be in this limbo state for, for months on end, but I, I don't have a plan yet for how we get out of it. But those are some of the things we've got to work through. Why, why are the lookups similar for the for the DHT but they're larger for IPNI is it just because well, they, we're storing less data and we're, we're not storing like interesting information in the provider records so it's it's only one thing for uh, IPNI you must have uh, basically one lookup is to get the uh, encrypted PRID the same as in, in the DHT 
And another lookup is to get, if you want to get the API specific information, such as like metadata, which is a protocol that the data can be fetched over. So, and they encrypt it over with different, um, with different keys. So uh, yeah, that's basically you need to move two instead of one because in, in either BFS, you assume, you assume bit swap by default, while in API you have, can have other protocols. But that second part is optional, right? That gives you extra information that the current THD wouldn't give you. So if yes, you, exactly. The option is just there. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, although I, it's just to, make, to be clear, I, the IPFS DHT does not, there's no like, it's not like you assume bit swap, you, you assume multi stream select, right? Which is like, uh, you do, you, you do a lib P2P connection and you say, I speak these things in these orders, which ones do you speak? And then you like take it from there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, which is, I mean, you could do that with, with, with IPNI, but we're trying to add in like more information, whether it's things to support non non lib P2P protocols or or just to give you more metadata about the lib P2P protocols, like you know the the hints for the Filecoin graph sync stuff. Exactly. I think that um, the main use case right now is the Filecoin graph sync thing, which just gives you like PCID. Is it verified? And it's not verified, which is you know is lib P2P is not a place to put it. Like you see, so we have to put it somewhere, and that's where the metadata thing in IPNI comes from. And is that driven by like is the reason why these things are are not hash like why these things aren't grouped together or why I can't like send them back to you together because in anticipation of like a writer privacy spec that's coming later? Or I, is I it, think a, a, yeah. a main motivation for it is to uh, reduce the explosivity of storage requirement because mm. all these records are encrypted. So what we are doing is that we encrypt the key uh, and then encrypt the value and then associate the key to the value and allow you to look up keys by values rather than encrypting key and value together. And then you end up with different records for every single uh, entry, which gives you, it, which needs much higher storage needs, right? It's an optimization. Yeah, so. okay. Yeah, it's a storage trade-off for, for time. Okay. I guess the second advantage is it keeps it close to the DHT lookup in that the first lookup is equivalent to the DHT, DHT one. And, and then hopefully results in better separation uh, or better interoperability between the two. Uh, Maybe, although I guess to some extent, the way I, way I see it is that the DHT is much harder to experiment with because like the rollouts and migrations are hard and IPNI is easier to experiment with, which means we're still like, we can use IPNI to explore like the metadata space and what that needs to look like. And once that's more fleshed out, then it becomes easier to say, okay, well, the DHT should support something similar. Um, but you yeah. don't want to be iterating too sense. much there because it just takes, at the moment, it takes us a long time to do it. I mean, there's stuff like what the Fluence people, I think, want to do where you, like, you know, you just, uh, you, like, deploy WASM code and it just runs everywhere. But that's not, that's not the world that we're, we're at at the moment. Right. Yeah, may, maybe this is something we need to iterate on. But, yeah, uh, it's, it's a good point, I think. Thank you. <laughs> um okay we'll keep that topic in mind as like potentially a work stream for future design discussion i think um it's it's a good one i i put two items here that maybe we can remediate maybe not but i just wanted to close the loop on them from our prior discussions and one was the the Thunderdome testing, I know we kind of had a, a pretty good discussion about like potential ways to approach the traffic responses we found there. And I just wanted to check in and see over the course of the last two weeks if we had gotten any additional feedback on it um, or we had recognized any different outcomes or perhaps had more 
context relative to um, why the test results came out the way that they did. Um, and specifically that's in regards to as we lowered the delay, we actually saw um, some increased traffic, which I think was surprising to us. So we didn't run any new um, Thunderdome experiment, but I think the explanation given by Dean some, sums up quite well um, why we have a worse result, worse CTFB uh, with a lower um, delay. Um, Got it. So, yeah, that there's a GitHub post. So it's basically the session things and yeah. Yeah, the, the good news is that at least some of the sessions uh, are going to, at least for gateway code, are going to be getting fixed. Um, likely as a function of the Rea stuff, because we're probably going to start bundling. We're going to be bundling everything together so that we can make like single requests to Rea, which will force us to correctly handle contexts. Um, or at least it should force us to do that. Uh, and so that will handle the gateway pathways, random other Kubo commands, maybe less so, but those, uh, those pathways are both like less critical. Um, and there's, they're, I guess, a little less gnarly so we can go find them. Thanks, Guy and Adine. I think um, that definitely answered my question there. And then uh, I think we, we kind of covered this earlier actually, so <laughs> we don't have to beat it up more. But I wanted to inquire about the DHT migration plan, and it sounds like, Guy, you're uh, taking ownership, but there is obviously some prioritization to, to do and uh, kind of timeline figuring out probably underway. Yeah, so we've discussed this during the, the probe lab call in Engelberg. And so I, I suggested a plan so to have to make a new DHT that would be upgradable, which means that it's very easy to push for upgrades to the DHT. But the idea, uh, so this would require a lot of engineering work to get it done and we'll need to implement it on Go and Rust and it seems like we don't have the capacity at the moment. So this idea was postponed and we're going more for a fork, like forking the, the DHT that we have. And so, um, yeah, we'll need to plan how we want to do this. And I haven't put so much effort in it as I've been more focused on the other solution. But um, yeah, I mean, once I, I get the capacity, I'll work on it. And totally. yeah, if anyone has some inputs, please let me know. So it is that it's too complicated to do the it's too complicated to do any of the gradual upgrade stuff because we don't want to have to implement it in in all the places, basically. Yeah. So yeah, that was um, Max's word uh, because yeah, there are other stuff more urgent to to tackle. But are they going to have time to do the full, like? At some point, they need to implement the double hashing stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, but that's in addition to the double hashing, which means that so right. we can have one large migration containing like one upgradable DHC and double hash, and so all future DHC migration will be easy, or we can do a quicker migration now with only double hashing, so less implementation work, but then the next migration will be painful. Yeah, and the other one is also just like the network load from running two of these things, the network load and security from running two of these things, one of which is much smaller than the other one. Um, but yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, I, that that size problem will be there regardless of which, you know, no, no, not necessarily. Because so, we're going to have to break it, even with the upgradable one, and then you're going to have but, a small, small DHT. But just once. Because anyway, we need to have a breaking change. Yeah, I'm just Maybe saying that this for... still applies though to the either either option. 
like About the new each. DHT. There will be a new DHT either way, and it's going to be small at first. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it just depends on like how you do the multiple queries, because what you can do is you could say, well, it's too small. I don't bother using it. I only start using it once it's big enough. Um, right. And that would sort of like allow the network to grow a little bit. Uh, but if if everyone has to, you know, it depends how expensive this is. If it's actually fine for everyone to do multiple queries, then then it's fine. Um, can we not just. Yeah, go ahead. I'm so sorry. I keep interrupting people. Can we not just add it to the waterfall of delegated routing lookups as a separate thing? Yeah, I mean, you can you can query an additional an additional network. It's just like how you know how expensive is it? Um, you also have to write to the additional network. You also have to do all the writes there. Which so all the reprovides will double. Or things like that. Uh, I guess I don't know. We have BitSwap, which is pretty expensive. How much more would it be compared to? So yeah. not consider much. consider for example, uh, you know, a big company a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. had some serious outages on the network because they couldn't reprovide fast enough. Um, and if we cut, if we have their reprovide throughput. Mm -hmm. um, it's not only going to be expensive for them, but also potentially, uh, uh, you know, there might be some, you know, operational events and stuff from doing that. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to find a way of rolling it out with some sort of uh, feature flag thing, you know, like safe defaults. With well, this is to some extent of... what I think. So, what like you was proposing with like the gradual network upgrades which maybe we can still kind of do, even if you only implement it on one of them, you just make everybody else wait for the second implementation, which is like- What, what do you mean? So I think the, the gradual network upgrade scheme was like, everybody's on the same network, but some of them speak super, some of them speak more RPCs than others. Yep. Right? So you just, you sort of do that and everybody, you know, reprovides the sort of both and the other and the the rust and the js people wait along and they don't get double hashing until like the vast majority of the network which is go nodes anyway have upgraded yeah so, so I, I hate to cut us off but we have hit time these are very valuable discussions and i want to thank you all again for participating in them this context is incredibly important I'll get to working on that roadmap. I'll summarize as always and put together a post uh, in the content routing work group. I hope you all have a great evening or morning, depending on where you're at. Uh, thanks, thanks again, Torfin. everybody. This is a great conversation. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, folks.